As we have seen thus far in our studies, Matthew's gospel is presenting Jesus as king. King of the Jews specifically, although not exclusively. Matthew portrays Jesus as king. And so in chapter 1, we saw that he started with Jesus' heritage. We saw that Jesus was in the royal lineage, a descendant of David. Thus, he was the rightful heir to the throne of Israel. The genealogy tells us that he truly has claims to being king of Israel, a son of David. And then in chapter 2, we see not only his heritage, but homage that was being paid to him by wise men who came from far regions, probably Babylon. They came to worship him whom they said is king of the Jews. They brought to him gold and frankincense and myrrh. Wise men still worship him, as the bumper sticker says. And they came proclaiming, yes, that he is king. So his heritage is in chapter 1. Homage to the king in chapter 2. Hostility towards the king when Herod wanted to destroy him because he was intimidated by him, this babe of Bethlehem. And then in chapter 3, after we see the hostility, then we see the heralding of the king. John the Baptist on the scene, wearing camel skins and eating locusts and wild honey, you know, grasshopper legs coming out of his mouth, and a rugged individual. And John the Baptist said, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And then, of course, John baptized Jesus Christ there in the Jordan. And when Jesus was lifted out of the water by the Baptist, the Holy Spirit descended upon him in the form of a dove. And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And then we go into chapter 4. And we see a challenge to the king, that is, Satan tempting him in the wilderness. And then we ended up by seeing the establishing of the headquarters for the king there in Galilee, the northern region of Israel. Kind of a forgotten, forsaken place, looked down upon by the citizens of Jerusalem, but it was there where people sat in a great darkness that Jesus, the light of the world, established his headquarters. And he began his ministry by teaching and sharing and healing and casting out demons. And people were amazed at his moving with such authority. Now, in chapter 5, as we continue on this flow, seeing Jesus as king, we come to the constitution of the kingdom, the Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5, 6, and 7. A magnificent, majestic sermon. And yet, I believe it's one of the most misunderstood passages in all of the New Testament. People often say that are not believers, well, my religion is the Sermon on the Mount. I live by the Sermon on the Mount. I always say, really, good luck. It's heavy. The Sermon on the Mount, I believe, this constitution of the kingdom is misunderstood. Ultimately, it has its fullest expression, if you would, when Jesus comes back. This is the constitution, I believe, of the kingdom that is coming. But it also serves its purpose for us presently in a very practical, very real way. Well, seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain 
And when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them. As the multitudes began coming, from a hundred miles or more away, they began coming, hearing of this man and his healings and his teachings and his workings. Jesus looked out and saw the multitudes, and he went up a hill, and he sat down preparing to teach. You see, in Jewish culture, if you were preaching, you would stand up. But if you were teaching, explaining, you would always sit down. The sitting position was the teacher's position. It, it sort of still is to this day. When a university wants to endow a certain teacher or a certain course, it will call that teacher or course the chair. We have a chair in philosophy or a chair in psychology, and they name that chair. It speaks of an elevated place of instruction, whoever has that chair or that position. When the pope speaks, when the pope in Rome is speaking on matters that deal with doctrine, in which the Catholics believe he is infallible, he will always be seated when he makes his proclamation. He is speaking ex-cathedra for you ex-Catholics or present Catholics. Ex-cathedra literally means from the chair. He's sitting and he's giving a teaching which they believe is infallible. The Roman church does. When Pope John Paul came to the United States, he was asked, you know, how did you enjoy your visit to America? He said, I, I love this country. Fascinating. But there's a couple of things that bother me greatly. Oh, what's that? All the Polish jokes. <laughs> Pope John Paul is Polish, of course. They, they, they make it sound as though all Polish people are kind of slow. That bothers me. Well, what else bothers you? Your candies, it's impossible to peel open the M&Ms. <laughs> no, he didn't really say that. But when the Pope speaks, ex cathedra, not on matters of M&Ms or Polish jokes, He speaks in a sitting position. So here we see Jesus sitting down, ready to give an authoritative, important, significant teaching. And he sat, and his disciples came, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them. He begins in verse 3 with a very famous portion of Scripture called the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes, literally, beatus in the Latin means happy. Because each one of these starts with the word blessed or literally happy. Did you know the Lord wants his people to be happy? Jesus starts this constitution of the kingdom with the path to happiness. Now our constitution promises life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We have that right to pursue happiness. But this constitution is not simply guaranteeing the pursuit of happiness, but the pathway to happiness. Jesus here begins by telling his citizens, kingdom children, how to be happy. The attitude that you should have. That's why I like it. Be attitudes. These are attitudes which you should be or have. The scriptures declare, happy is the people whose God is the Lord. David said, happy is the man whose sins are forgiven. I believe the Bible knows nothing of a dour, heavy Christianity. I believe that Scripture indicates that the people of God should indeed be the happiest, most joyful people on the face of the earth. 
Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. And here Jesus begins by saying, and here is the pathway to happiness. Blessed or happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Number one. The first step to happiness is to be self-assertive, confident, I'm okay, you're okay. Esteem yourself. Feel good about who you are. That's not what Jesus said. He said, blessed or happy are those who are poor in spirit, who realize their own spiritual poverty. Interesting. Anyone who really sees the Lord will inevitably feel poverty in spirit. You recall the prophet Isaiah who, when he burst on the scene, in the first five chapters, indicted the people of Judah, the surrounding nations, by saying, woe unto you, and woe unto you, and woe unto you, and woe unto you. And then in chapter 6, we read, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and I said, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I am undone. When you really see the Lord, this idea of I'm okay, you're okay, self-esteem doesn't make it. You say, Woe is me. In comparison to who he is and his standards of rightness and the beauty of his holiness, man, woe is me. When Peter realized who Jesus was, there on that boat in the Sea of Galilee, he said, depart from me, I am a sinful man. When John the Revelator saw Jesus Christ, he fell down as though he was dead. Happiness starts when you really realize that you're not okay, that you're a sinner. Now, now we don't like that in this society. There is something perverse in the human personality. We want to be worshipped. That's the whole appeal of Shirley MacLaine out on a lane, uh, <laughs> out on a lane. <laughs> That would be a great title for a message. <laughs> but that's the whole appeal of the whole New Age mentality is that, is that you are God. So therefore, you deserve to be worshipped. People want to be worshipped, to be noted, to be applauded, to be appreciated. They want their names and pictures in the paper. They want people to applaud them and approve them. We're on a great, big, huge ego trip, fallen man is. It's one big ego trip. Why? Because it stems from a basic, perverted part of our personality saying, worship me, aren't I hot? God says, no, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. That's new age mentality. I am God. Now, if I'm expecting other people to worship me, then i got to feel good about myself, so that means I have to adopt the new self-esteem theology that is being propagated in Southern California, where else? <laughs> self-esteem, esteem yourself, you know, all of that kind of stuff. That's not what Jesus taught. I, I understand why people want to feel good about themselves because that justifies others worshiping them they need to feel like well i better worship myself and so others can appreciate me and aren't we hot you see jesus says blessed are the poor in spirit theirs is the kingdom of heaven when you realize well lord i'm a sinner that leads to step two blessed are they that mourn once you realize that you are a sinner, that you have perverted tendencies, embedded iniquities, when you really realize the truth of yourself, that you're poor in spirit, then you begin to mourn. And Jesus said, happy is the one who mourns. 
he shall be comforted. Because when you realize you're a sinner and mourning over your sin, that's when the Lord comes to you and says, hey, I don't condemn you. Go your way and sin no more. That's what the woman who was caught in the act of adultery heard. Mourning. The prostitute who fell at the feet of Jesus, weeping. Oh, she was comforted. Leave her alone, Pharisees, Jesus said. I came into this house, Simon, and you didn't greet me with a kiss, and you didn't anoint me with oil, but she has kissed my feet and anointed my feet with oil. And Jesus said, the one who is forgiven much loves much. In that state of realizing her poverty and her mourning, she entered into the kingdom and she was comforted. This doesn't play too well in today's psychology classes, does it? And that's why all of the psychology students are so happy and at peace. Have you noticed that? <laughs> Did you know psychiatrists and psychologists are number one in percentage of suicides of any vocation in our society today? Because what they're saying doesn't work. Jesus said, hey, blessed, happy is the man who is poor in spirit. He shall enter the kingdom. Who mourns for his sin, he shall be comforted. Who is meek, verse 5, that's the one who will inherit the earth. Meek. Now, meekness is not weakness. Meekness is strength that is under control. The word meek, praus in the Greek, speaks of a term that was used when a horse, a powerful stallion, let's say, was broken and then was usable as he was submitted to his rider, to his owner. Meekness means power that is under control. We read in the Old Testament that Moses was called the meekest man on the face of the earth. How do we know that he was the meekest man? Because Moses told us. <laughs> in his writings, in the Pentateuch, in Exodus, Moses tells us in a parenthetical statement, now Moses was the meekest man on the face of the earth. <laughs> I like that. Oh. <laughs> Moses was known for his meekness in the Old Testament, and Jesus was known for his meekness in the New Testament. Jesus said, come unto me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. For I am meek and lowly in heart. That is the only time that Jesus describes his personality directly. I am meek and lowly in heart. Approachable, usable, touchable, relatable. Jesus. And so too, after a person realizes that they are poor in spirit and mourning, they, they find themselves meek, no longer strutting, no longer primping, no more vain glory, but they're meek. Strength that's harnessed now for the purposes of the king and only for the king. Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. That assertive mentality is no more. That's what Jesus said would bring happiness. The world says, assert yourself, strut your stuff. Jesus says, blessed are the meek. And verse 6, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness or rightness. They shall be filled. Notice the flow. Follow the order. First you're poor in spirit. Then you're mourning over your sin. Then you find yourself meek. And now that you've got rid of all that crud of self-grandeur and self-glory, 
now you're hungering and thirsting because you're empty of all that junk. I am convinced personally that the reason many people are not filled, as verse 6 says, is because they have not been emptied. They are still full of themselves, and they're not happy. That crud has got to go before you find yourself hungering and thirsting for righteousness. My wife fixes me excellent meals, but if I, as I have been known to do sporadically, stop off and score a couple of burgers before I head home, <laughs> even though there's an excellent meal spread on the table, I don't have an appetite for it because I'm full of burgers and shakes. So too, some people have lost their appetite for the Word of God. They no longer desire to worship. They no longer crave for rightness. There was a time in their life when they craved for rightness. But now they don't. Because they're no longer moving in meekness, no longer mourning, no longer poor in spirit. They're filled with burgers and shakes. But when you empty yourself of those things, Happy are you because you're going to hunger and thirst once more for righteousness and you'll be filled. Ban the burgers, gang. And then, after being filled with rightness, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Once you've been filled with the Spirit of God, which is rightness, it's right. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And you'll find yourself being merciful towards others, not judgmental, not critical, not analytical, but you'll realize your own poverty of spirit. You've mourned for your own sin. There's a sense of meekness now in your life. You, you have gone through the emptying process. Now you're filled with his love, and you'll find yourself being merciful towards others. I believe the more righteous a man or a woman is, the more mercy they will show. I believe the more sin is actively playing a part in my life, the more harsh and critical I will be. We'll talk about that more a little later when Jesus touches that point directly. But blessed are the merciful, and blessed are then the pure in heart, verse 8, for they shall see God. Please note here, you students of Scripture, there's a difference between having a clean heart and a pure heart. Who is the one who sees God? Happy is the one who is pure in heart because they'll see God. Who is the one who sees God? Not just the person with a clean heart. We, we've all been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, those of us who have embraced the Lord. Now, all soap is clean. Dial, coast, palm olive, it's all clean, but there's only one soap that's pure. Ivory. 99.999% <laughs> pure. That's on their label. Because ivory soap doesn't have deodorants or perfumes or additives or pollutants or whatever. Ivory is just soap. There's nothing but soap. Other soaps add their stuff. They're clean, but they're not pure. What does it mean to have a pure heart? It means that it's not simply a matter of being clean by the blood, but you're not being distracted by this trinket and that trip and that hobby and that weird idea. Th those things, although those things may not be sin, 
They're just perfumes and deodorants and additives and colorings. And you wonder, but those things aren't bad. And the Lord says, no, they're not. But yet it keeps you from seeing me. All these things. John, why don't I see God? Could it be because you're no longer pure in heart? Are you saying I'm a sinner? No. I'm not saying you're a sinner. You might have a clean heart, but do you have a pure heart? Or has your vision been obscured by a bunch of stuff? Still clean, but no longer ivory. Now you're palm olive. Coast, dial, perfumed, deodorized, but no longer pure. <laughs> but those, Jesus said, who are pure in heart, all oh, blessed will they be, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Peacemakers. There's no joy in the world like bringing somebody to the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, that they might experience peace in their hearts. I suggest to you that being a peacemaker is not necessarily wearing a peace symbol or joining the Peace and Freedom Party <laughs> or marching against the nukes or marching for the whales or whatever it might be. I suggest to you that the finest peacemaking activity that you can engage yourself is in is in introducing people to the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. And you'll be blessed. Think of the opportunities that you've had to talk to somebody about Jesus or to bring somebody to church or what have you, where they began to open up their lives to Jesus, that was one of the highlights of your life when you saw that friend, that relative, that parent, that child open up their heart to Jesus. I mean, you're blessed. Blessed are the peacemakers. <laughs> Happy are those who make peace. They shall be called the children of God. Now, I would think at this point, man, if a person was living in this kind of mentality, having these kinds of attitudes within them, if they were aware of their own poverty, mourning over their sin, becoming a meek individual, hungering and thirsting after rightness, living in purity of heart, showing mercy, that man, that person would be really, really popular and embraced. But notice what happens. Jesus goes on to say, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake, Rejoice, be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. You're going to be persecuted if these attitudes are being worked out in you. In 2 Timothy 1.7, Paul says this, Yea, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's a promise. If you're living godly, you will be persecuted. You will have enemies. You'll be slandered and misunderstood. Maybe even the time is coming when you'll be physically hurt. I don't know. But you'll be persecuted. That's a promise, 2 Timothy 1. You know, those kinds of promises we often don't underline. <laughs> all those who live godly shall be... Per we underline, my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches. 
Delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Lo, I am with you always. Sometimes I think it would be a good thing for us to go through our Bibles and meditate on every verse that is not underlined. <laughs> every verse that we sort of don't want to mark or think about too much, that would be a good exercise. Study the verses that you don't have underlined, like all those who live godly shall suffer persecution. But Jesus said, happy is the one who is persecuted. You're joining a great company, the company of the prophets. And man, you will have profit in heaven. Exceedingly great reward. You know those guys that were sawn in half that Hebrews talks about, that were living in caves, that were destitute and persecuted, men of faith? Do you think those guys in heaven are now saying, what a bummer. Man, I wish that we didn't get persecuted. I wish that instead we took an easier route and had a newer chariot when we were in Israel. Or, 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 or an extra room on our house. Or a couple more robes to wear around town. Do you think they're saying that? But instead we got persecuted sawn in half, kicked around, beat up? Or do you think they're saying, great, thank you, Father, for the privilege that you've given us to suffer for the sake of the cross? Because when they see the Lord, they'll be embraced by the Lord, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy. Do you think those chariots that they left behind are going to be alluring them? I don't think so. <laughs> Jesus said, be happy because your reward in heaven is going to be great when men persecute you, and they will. But notice this before we leave this verse. When they speak all manner of evil, verse 11, against you falsely for my name's sake. A lot of times Christians are being persecuted, not because they're living righteously, but because they're weird. <laughs> And that doesn't count. <laughs> Man, if you're a weirdo and you're getting persecuted, you deserve it and it counts for nothing. <laughs> when I was in San Jose many years ago now, there was a couple of, of ladies uh, that were arrested because they were going around preaching the gospel visually by saying that you had to have faith like a mustard seed. And to illustrate that, they took off all their clothes and they spread mustard all over their bodies. They clothed themselves in mustard to give this sermon on the streets of San Jose. They were arrested, and when they were arrested, they claimed that they were being persecuted falsely for the sake of Jesus. No, they weren't. Now, the Lord does say in Peter's epistle that we are a peculiar people. <laughs> but, but the word peculiar there does not mean what it means today, weird. It means that we're a valuable, unique people. Don't think there's anything noble about being weird. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 42, it says concerning Jesus that he would not cry nor strive in the streets. In other words, he would not cause disruptions or draw attention to himself. He was as wise as a serpent and as harmless as a dove. Well, if though you are being persecuted righteously when men say evil about you falsely for his name's sake, then rejoice. This is the way to be happy, gang. This is the way to be happy, right here. The attitudes that will lead you to happiness and fulfillment. Poverty of spirit, mourning over sin, a meekness which is 
no longer strutting, but now submitted to his authority in your life, hungering and thirsting after righteousness, being merciful, being pure in heart, being a peacemaker, being persecuted. These are the keys to happiness. He then declares in verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out, to be trodden under the foot of men. You are the salt of the earth. If you've lost your saltiness, it's good for nothing but to be cast out of the house and walked on. Salt really has a very important function in, in that culture and even in ours. Salt has certain qualities. It promotes thirst. When you eat something salty, man, you get thirsty. We should be doing that. We should be little grains of salt to the people that we're around. We are the salt of the earth. They should get thirsty for the living water of Jesus Christ. Just being around you, man, they should say, man, you're salty. Not your language, hopefully. But man, that there's something about you that creates in me a thirst for what you're enjoying. Salt also preserves. If you salt meat, it doesn't rot. Salt also brings healing. I can recall, I used to boast, as I know a couple of others of you perhaps did, I used to never get poison oak when I was growing up until I was a teenager and I was boasting to some of my buddies that I, I would never get poison oak and they showed me a patch and yeah, you know the story. <laughs> I went through it and I got so infected with poison oak that I had to go in the hospital. And then after a couple of days in the hospital, they, they put me out, um, you know, back home again. And I was home for several days, and, and it was starting to go down because of the medications and stuff, but it was real gross. And so my mom said to me, you know, the best thing for you, I think, is for you to go over to the beach and soak in the salt. I said, well, if that's what you think, Mom. <laughs> So I went over to Santa Cruz and, uh, you know, just spent the day, you know, surfing and soaking in the salt. And, and it had an amazing healing property. Amazing healing property. And because I found that to be a remedy recommended by my mom and, and she would steer me in that direction, it's amazing how often I got poison oak in the springtime. <laughs> Getting to go over to the beach and salt it out. <clears throat> don't tell her that. <laughs> but salt does that. And Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, creating, promoting thirst, providing healing, preserving society. Now, if the salt is not doing its job, it is good for nothing. If our society is putrefying, if our society is decaying, instead of indicting our society or critiquing our political leaders, perhaps we as the church, the salt, should be repenting, Lord, have we lost our saltiness? Is society stinking because the salt is no longer working? Have we lost our flavor, our effectiveness? When there's a problem in society, I really do believe that the church should go to her knees repenting that we should be broken before the Lord saying, where have we failed, Father? Not, can you believe how terrible they are? Can you believe how raunchy that guy is? How rotten that system is? But rather, Lord, you tell us that we are the salt of the earth. And if there's raunchiness, is it because we have lost our effectiveness?
That is why in Chronicles it says, if my people, which are called by my name, humble themselves, repent, turn from their wicked ways, I will hear their prayers and heal their land. It starts with us. You see, we are the salt. And he said, not only are you the salt of the earth with an important role to play, but you, verse 14, are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it gives light unto all that are in the house. So let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The salt of the earth, the light of the world. Let your lights shine, man. How? So that when people see your good works, they will glorify your Father, which is in heaven. You know what amazes me about Jesus? Is every time he did a miracle, every time he worked a wonder, it says, and the people saw it and glorified God. They didn't ask for him to pose for a picture. or take him on a speaking tour about the miracles that he was doing. But they just glorified the Father. That is not an easy thing. How I respect and admire and reverence Jesus for being able to work in such a way that he didn't draw attention or glory to himself directly, but the people glorified the Father. Let us seek to follow that example. Let us seek. Lord, when we do good things, may they glorify you truly. Now, there's a way in which we can say, well, now, it, that's just glory to God. Hallelujah. That's not me. It's not me. It's not me. And you're talking so much about it not being you that people are all they're thinking about is you, you see. That, that's, that's bogus. Whenever I, I, I hear that kind of talk, I always get real suspicious. Like Shakespeare said, thou protesteth too much. <laughs> You're bringing up it's not you too much. You must think that it is you or want us to think it's you. Let your works be seen by men and let them glorify the Father. That's a good goal. Not easy. We need wisdom and help and constant maturing in that understanding. Then Jesus said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Truly or verily I say to you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I am not coming to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. I am not seeking to undo it, but to establish it. Now, what does that mean? I think Galatians chapter 3, I'll read it to you, tells us exactly what the law was for and how Jesus fulfilled it. Now, think with me. Mark it down in your notes. Galatians 3, 24. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster, for we are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. What was the purpose of the law? Galatians 3 says the purpose of the law was to show you that you're a sinner to drive you to Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I have come to fulfill the law. That is, I will keep it in my own living. 
No one will find fault with me. I will not be violating a single precept or understanding. But more than that, in me the law is fulfilled. That is, its purpose is accomplished. It's a schoolmaster. People think, well, I'm pretty good. The law says, okay, here's your standard. And suddenly you read through the law and you realize, wow, I'm a sinner. That's the purpose of the law. In the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 4, the apostle Paul declares that the law was fulfilled completely in the person of Christ Jesus. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Jesus fulfilled the law. How? Because he kept it, it was fulfilled in him, and because it's done its job in driving us to him. That's the purpose of the law. Now, the law is no longer needed by believers. That brings us into the next verse, which is the key for the entire sermon. It is really the foundational understanding for this Constitution. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. I have not come to destroy the law, the Old Testament rules and regulations, but to fulfill them. And I say to you, unless your righteousness is greater than the Pharisees and scribes, you're not going to enter into the kingdom. Gang, this would be shocking to the people that were hearing this. The Jews had a saying in that time that went something like this. If only two men make it into heaven, one will be a Pharisee and the other will be a scribe. Now Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds the Pharisees and scribes, you're not going to make it in. Who were these Pharisees? They were devoted, the separated ones is what the word means literally, 7,000 in number, this company of men who kept the most minute detail of the law radically. The law said that they were to do no work on the Sabbath day. They would take out their false teeth, unscrew their wooden legs, lest they be guilty of carrying a burden, doing work on the Sabbath day. The law said that you could only travel so many cubits on the Sabbath day. They were devoted to keeping it exactingly, but sometimes these Pharisees had to move farther than what the law prescribed. So what they would do on Friday, they would construct all these lean-tos down the road, one after another, several hundred cubits away that was still within the regulation of the law, they would go to one lean-to on the Sabbath day and say, this is my new house. Then they'd go to the next one and say, now this is my new house, the next one, and this is my new house, and they'd go down the road many miles until they got to their proper destiny. But they kept the law, theoretically. Now, the law, you know, their, their understanding of the law was you could not write on the Sabbath day because writing was a form of work. So what they did was they used ink out of a certain kind of fruit that disappeared after a week or two because they said if you write and the ink disappears, then the work is not lasting, thus it is not work, and thus they would go ahead and use this fruit ink to, uh, to keep the, the, the letter of the law, you see. They were so committed, the Pharisees were, to not looking at a woman inappropriately that they were known in that community as the bump and stumbling Pharisees because they walked with their heads down and they ran into walls and they got bruised up and bumped into things. They would literally walk with their head. These guys were righteous or so it seemed. When it came to tithing, that is, giving one-tenth of everything they had, they would count out their salt and pepper and spices and say, nine spices for me, one grain for God, nine for me, one for... They kept the most minute detail. And people said, wow, these are holy men, Pharisees. They were called the separated company. The scribes? 
They were your scholars, studied endlessly the law and interpreted it and commentated on it. And Jesus now says, gang, you have to be more righteous than these Pharisees and scribes to enter into the kingdom. What? Then these guys? Now, now we look at the Pharisees humorously today. They didn't then. These were your, in today's terms, Billy Grahams, Chuck Swindolls, Jack Hayfords, whoever you might esteem. These were, wow, these are the heavyweights, the Pharisees, and now Jesus is saying our righteousness has got to exceed them. Now, this is the key to the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is saying, if you think that you can make it into the kingdom and be a part of the kingdom without me as your savior, you got to be awfully good, like perfect. You see, this whole message was meant to drive us to Jesus Christ and the cross. If you miss that, you will not really benefit from this Sermon on the Mount. The whole point was, as he ends this chapter, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. So when people say, I live by the Sermon on the Mount, I say, oh, 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 good luck. Because Jesus said in the sermon, be perfect. And unless your righteousness exceeds the most holy men, so to speak, you will not enter into the kingdom Man, you're in trouble, dude. But that's the point. He's showing people that they have to have a Savior, one who died for their sins. They're not good enough on their own. They won't make it in. And as you study this through, you're going to be mourning, poor in spirit, meek, Oh, you're going to say, Lord, I, I, I can't keep this. And that's the point. This is Jesus teaching on the law, what it was really all about. He says, let me explain to you what perfection really is. It's not the Pharisees and scribes. It goes much deeper than that. Quickly, he says, you have heard it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill. Ooh, we're going to stop here. Back up. Time out. We'll stop at verse 20, and uh, we will look at what Jesus has to say about the law. That nobody was keeping it, that nobody could keep it, and how that would force them to realize their need for a savior, for a redeemer. Well, shall we bow our heads, please? Please note here, this sermon was meant to drive people to Jesus Christ. But after we have acknowledged Jesus Christ, it is to direct us in Jesus Christ. We realize that we cannot keep it, that we need a Savior who died for us, that we cannot keep the loftiness of these standards that Jesus is teaching. So we come to him with humility and say, Lord, I'm a sinner, have mercy upon me. And then he is forgiving and redeeming. Salvation is yours. But once we do that, now this sermon helps to direct us in Christ. Now I begin to see, yes, Lord, this is kingdom kind of living. Where I have failed, your blood has cleansed me. But the standard is now before me. To live in this kind of mentality, Lord, by your strength, help me. 
It drives us to Christ. It directs us in Christ. Now, saints, he starts out not by being heavy, but by saying, be happy. I'm going to tell you how. Let these attitudes be in you. Poverty of spirit, purity of heart, hungering for rightness, mourning over your sinfulness. Man, you'll be happy. It would do us well, I believe, to really give time this week to consider the Beatitudes. Lord, are these the attitudes that I'm living in? Or have I lost this kind of kingdom mentality? Am I now becoming more and more like a worldling, living more in the systems of this world? Have I been seduced by this world? Maybe the Lord is speaking to our hearts from this mountaintop tonight. Maybe he's saying to us, you know why you're not happy? Because you've lost that kingdom mentality. Go back. Mourn. Be poor in spirit. Return once again to that radicalness. That's the way to happiness. That's the constitution of my kingdom. Lord, I pray that we might hear your words, that your spirit might correct and adjust our hearts. Jesus, thank you for coming on the scene and teaching with authority. It's so different than what the world is saying, than what the media is propagating. But Lord, many of us have seen the emptiness of that, and we thank you for the realness of your word. Jesus, thank you for coming and teaching and sharing. Now, may these attitudes be in us. Oh, Lord, have mercy on us. May this be more and more of our mentality. May these things be true in the life of this church corporately, Lord. We receive your word tonight and believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.